So a theme that has come up repeatedly over the last couple of weeks for us here in the readings is the idea that we can be so focused on the tangible things around us, the things that we see, um, our careers, our appearance, uh, all of these kind of things that, that are very visible and tangible, you know, you can quantify them. Uh, the danger with focusing too much or exclusively uh, on these things is that we can forget the spiritual realities that surround us. And indeed, the spiritual realities are even more important than the physical realities. Right, so the things, the, things, the things that exist up there in heaven, the, the reality of our soul, you don't see it, but it's more important. It lasts longer. We're not, we're not, we're not, we don't disregard the body, of course, nor do we disregard creation. There's that, there was, there has been that tendency uh, uh, in, in the past as well to have what they call a dualist view of, of reality. So material things are bad, spiritual things are good. Your body is bad, your soul is good. That's not what we're saying. But we're saying these material things, they, they, they will pass. You know, the, if, if our focus is on, on accumulating and building, that's, that's, that's pointless long term. That, that's pointless. Whereas if our focus is on getting to heaven, we will also treat creation well. We will also treat our bodies well. We will also treat our brother well. So if, if, if the priorities are in the right order, everything else makes sense. Whereas you put your career, creation, things, your body first, and then God somewhere down the line, then you're going to walk on other people to get there. You're going to, you know, not give people the time they deserve because you need to be going to the gym and everything will start to just kind of fall apart. You put God first, everything finds its place. So, okay, so just so we're not dualist. But at the same time, uh, spiritual realities are, are the most important realities. We don't see God and yet he's more real than, than anything. <laughs> he is reality, okay? We don't see him though. We don't see our soul. You know, that's, that's, that's going to live forever. Our soul is immortal once it has been, from the moment of its creation, it's not immortal in the same way that God is immortal. God is immortal in the sense that God has no beginning or end. We just have a definite beginning, but we will live forever. Now, where we will be, that's yet to be decided, but we will live forever. We will exist forever, okay? We're not, we won't cease to exist at any point, which is quite amazing. So the reality of our soul is, is, is it's exceptionally important and yet easy to disregard because we don't see it. Okay, heaven, we don't see it. So easy again to disregard. Uh, St. Paul tells us, it's not, it's not in the readings of today, uh, but St. Paul tells in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. So our, the battle that we're engaged in isn't against flesh and blood, but basically he's, he's going through a list of different types of, dare I say, angel, de demons, fallen angels. Okay, this is our struggle. So the struggle that we're engaged in here, the, on, on the most important level of it is that it's a spiritual battle. And that's why any renewal in a parish will only come through a foundation of spiritual means. If there's no grace, if we're not aiming to receive grace or transmit grace, then it's just a human activity and... It's, yeah, it'll be nice and we'll pat ourselves on the back and go home and give ourselves some medals, take some photos, get a, a photo on the Tipperary Star, and, uh, and that's it. But, like, so, you know, souls won't be changed, so why bother? Um, so, on the other hand, if we focus on, on spiritual realities and get those right, everything else starts to make sense. When I give time to God, when I give time to the sacraments, when I try to live a sacramental life, live from the power of the Eucharist. And when I fail or fall or when I don't succeed in, 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 in living virtue, I go to confession. My soul is wiped clean. Again, I draw from God's grace and on I go, carried by him, sustained by him, strengthened by him, again, to, to learn virtue, to purify my heart, to be transformed into love so that I'm ready for heaven. Uh, and if I do that, all the other bits and pieces will fall into place. Something that we spoke about here in community life, um, when Teresa was, was giving her presentation on our acts of service around the house. When you're hoovering, you don't just hoover to get the job done, or you don't just hoover so that someone will catch you hoovering and say, aren't you amazing? Uh, but you hoover it out of love for God, and also out of love for your community. 
So if I take the head off the hoover in order to just have the tube, and then with said tube, go into the corners, right, to make sure I catch everything, you know, in the very corners under the skirt and board, into the corners of the room, all that kind of thing. I was going to say no one will see it. I don't, I'll see it. Uh, not everyone will see it. Um, but, uh, but God does. God does. So you do, that, you do it out of love. So then even these kind of apparently insignificant tasks become meaningful on a spiritual level. They become a way to, to learn virtue, a way to renounce your will, a way to please God, a way to do things out of love. It's amazing it's just how the ordinary things can become extraordinarily important. So we're engaged in a spiritual battle, which is around us all the time. Sometimes, sometimes, not very often, but sometimes that spiritual battle as a spiritual battle becomes apparent as in it becomes visible. It's not very common because the enemy does not want to become visible because basically he's so ugly that if, if we saw him, we'd, I think many of us would be very much encouraged to pray, convert, go to confession. You know, uh, if we were to see the ugliness of sin, the ugliness of demons, uh, it would be, I think, a great motivation to convert. I think if, if everyone were to be present at an occasional exorcism, I don't think you'd have much doubt anymore in the supernatural, nor in the power of grace, the power of like holy water, crucifixes, the power of, of the priesthood, the power of, of sacraments. All these kind of things would become very apparent if you were present at an exorcism. And then, you know, how the, the demon can read your sins if there are sins there. And if, there are, if you've confessed, then he can't read them because they're not there anymore but he knows. He can tell the difference. He can also tell the difference between a consecrated host and an unconsecrated host, between you know, a priest and someone who's just dressed up as a priest. They can tell. They can also tell the difference between a priest and a priest who hasn't got the mandate from the bishop to be an exorcist. So if you don't have permission from the bishop to be an exorcist, you're not an exorcist. You're, you're, you're a priest without the necessary authority, and he knows that. So like, it's very interesting. So when you see someone crawling on the ceiling upside down, scowling down at you, you're not a priest. You know, I think I would pray the rosary. I would be, I would be fairly encouraged, you know? So, so that's, that's generally why demons don't show themselves. It's just, so, you know, like we see uh, some of these things have been kind of Hollywoodized at times. We see on movies, haunted houses and things. And while there are definitely spiritual realities out there, generally speaking, uh, they, they do hide because the... The negative ones, as I say, the, the demons are so ugly that they would, they would cause us to convert. Many of us, anyway. So they, they remain hidden. They remain hidden. But they try to influence us. They do still try to influence us. And it's not often, but it, I think some of us, maybe on different occasions, might have actually had an experience of evil. Uh, there are two places that come to mind now. One, when I visited, I visited Auschwitz uh, years ago, a um, long time ago. Uh, 18, 19 years ago or something. And walking around, it was actually a beautiful summer's day. So it was bright, blue skies, uh, little, little birds flying and all this kind of thing. But once you pass that threshold where it says Arbeit macht frei, uh, work makes you free, and you enter into the, into the camp and there's the barbed wire and some of the buildings have been reconstructed and there's just such a profound sense of evil and pain and hurt and loss and misery, even though, as I say, externally, it looked fine. But just somehow your soul can perceive awful things happened here. Awful, it was, what, 50, 60 years ago now, more. Uh, but you can, it's somehow the, the spirituality of the place, you know, that you, you feel it like, you feel it. There's something wrong here. You know, the, the only other place I felt something similar in a very different kind of a circumstance was a particular nightclub that I went to, uh, again, a long time ago, uh, way before I got the collar and so on. But I was there and, you know, the big thumping beats and somewhat of an odor of the old hashish, which obviously I wasn't partaking of, but uh, one could smell it. And I just looked around and remember thinking, this, this, this place feels, it feels, it, kind of, it feels evil. I don't sound all judgmental, but just this place really feels evil like. There's something wrong here, you know? Uh, so sometimes we can perceive spiritual realities. Generally speaking, they do hide, as I say, because they would actually 
be a, a great encouragement to our conversion. But the battle that we are engaged in is a, primarily a spiritual one. Also, like for the renewal of the church, renewal of parishes, youth ministry, adult ministry, any of these things, primarily, obviously there are practical aspects as well, but primarily it's spiritual. You get the spiritual right, the other bits will follow. You get the spiritual wrong, it doesn't matter what you do. It'll be a failure. So, we have guardian angels, we have archangels, a guardian angel appointed to each one of us, guardian angels fighting there above us, so there's choirs of angels, but you serve, seraphs and cherubs and the whole lot up there, adoring God, praising God, and trying to encourage us and direct us to do the same, to direct our whole lives towards God, adore him, praise him, give everything back to him, honor him. So we're not alone. The Lord promised, I will not leave you orphans. So he gives us everything. Gives us his mom, gives us his own body and blood, gives us angels, gives us grace through a myriad of means, primarily the sacraments, but then also through prayer and sacramentals. He gives us everything we need to get to heaven. And so in the spiritual battle, let us be aware of what we're playing for, of what this whole battle is about. It's about eternal life. It's about heaven. It's about our eternal happiness. And let us use all the means at our disposal, all the weapons in our arsenal to conquer evil, not by our power, because we don't stand a chance. He's much smarter than us. But by the grace of God, by the power of his name, the power of his blood, Lord Jesus, may we march on in this battle unafraid because you have already won the victory. Amen.